Welcome to the Sermon Audio Podcast with Pastor Paul Pett from Redeemer Lutheran Church. Subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast app. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. My text tonight is our gospel lesson. He was a professional thief. He was the terror of the Wild West. This man was known for riding on horseback with his face covered and for robbing Wells Fargo um, stagecoaches. In fact, he was so good at robbing Wells Fargo stagecoaches that he accumulated several hundred thousand dollars from it back in the late 1800s when several hundred thousand dollars was a considerable amount of money. From 1875 until 1883, he was the terror of the Wild West. Many rugged cowboys feared to guard those stagecoaches because of the man they called Black Bart. They called him Black Bart because no sketch artist was ever ever able to get a depiction of his face. He kept it covered with a mask when he did the robberies. Black Bart was a terror. But today I want to talk to you about another kind of terror. This is another Black Bart. But this Black Bart doesn't come to steal your watch or your jewelry or your money. Rather, he comes to steal your self-esteem, your self-worth, and your relationship with your family and friends, with your co-workers, with other people who are around you. And the name of this black bark is guilt. We all know what guilt is like, don't we? I think everyone has experienced it. It is this sort of quagmire of remorse this thing that holds you down, that prevents you from interacting with other people, that sometimes just accuses you all day long and never gives you any relief. And so this black bart of guilt often comes uh, to rob us of peace of mind and relationships with others. In fact, in some ways it's far worse than a thief who steals your money or your jewelry because this thief is a relationship killer. Is there anyone out there that's never experienced guilt? I don't know. I would imagine that all of us have experienced guilt and maybe some of us have guilt that plagues us week in and week out, year in and year out. I sometimes wonder about a few people who are maybe a little bit... um, I don't know the proper term, if they're uh, psychotic, that's probably not the right term, but there are some people out there that probably due to childhood trauma or something, they, they just um, have an antisocial personality and they can't feel guilt, they can't put themselves in another person's shoes. But I think this not, these kind of people are very rare in society. There might be a few of them. I've sometimes speculated that I wonder if Vladimir Putin might be one of them, since he doesn't seem to care, given his actions there in Ukraine. Maybe he doesn't uh, have any remorse over what's happening there. But the vast majority of us aren't like that. The majority of us are more sensitive. We carry guilt with us. And we all probably have something that plagues us regularly. It could be something that you said to your child while your child was growing up. Maybe you said something harsh in a moment of weakness or exasperation and it stung your child and you know your child still thinks about it to this day. Or maybe it was something that you said to your spouse or your ex-spouse. Maybe it was something you said to a co-worker. Uh, Maybe it was something else. Maybe it was an addiction that you either suffered from or you continue to suffer from. Uh, But we all understand guilt. So it's easy for us to put ourselves in Peter's place tonight as we read that gospel lesson and we look at how Peter must have felt in the courtyard of the high priest on that night. Uh, 
that night in which he denied the Lord three times, um, he must have been overwhelmed with guilt. And yet, we don't stay in that courtyard. We look beyond the courtyard of the high priest to the hill of Calvary, where we see another word that begins with G as well. And this G word is the word grace. And that's what we see in Mount Calvary. Sometimes we have to rewind the tape a little bit from our gospel lesson today. Think about a little bit of, of Peter, since he's our, our topic, our, our man of interest this evening. Um, go all the way back to how Jesus met Peter. You guys know the story. Uh, Peter was just probably having a regular day out fishing. And his brother Andrew came up to him and said, I think I've met the Messiah. I think it's this Jesus guy. And uh, if you remember, Andrew became a believer first. Uh, but over time, Jesus probably grew a little bit closer to Peter. And Peter became part of this inner ring that Jesus had. You know, uh, we don't like to think about Jesus' um, disciples as being in sort of a hierarchical relationship, but they really kind of were. I mean, you have the 70 disciples who we hardly hear. We, we, see, we hear mention of them, but we don't get a lot about the 70, right? Or 72, depending on your translation. Uh, and, then, and then you get the 12. Of course, they're obviously a little more important to Jesus. He spends a little more time with them. They have a little more authority. They're the ones called the apostles in the New Testament. And then even among the 12 apostles, you've got this inner circle, which is Peter, James, and John. And I know not that many weeks ago, you guys had the lesson on the transfiguration. So you know how Jesus didn't take all of his disciples up on the mountain there. He just took Peter, James, and John, and only Peter, James, and John were able to converse with Moses and Elijah. Only they saw him transfigured there. Um, and throughout um, their relationship, Jesus had this sort of closer relationship with, with this trio. And of the three of them, the one with whom he was closest in one sense, at least in terms of teaching him leadership, was Peter. Of course, the disciple that he loved often was John, so he had a different kind of closeness with John. Um, but think about how close Peter was. Um, think about how Jesus selected him to be the leader of the 12 apostles. Think about how Peter once boldly confessed, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Peter knew that there was eternal life in no one besides Jesus. And Peter was even bold to make a big promise. One day Peter said to Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. That's quite a bold promise to make, isn't it? I will lay down my life for you. Would any of us make such a bold promise to the Lord that we would rather give up our lives than, than deny our Lord? Well, I hope if you're thinking through your life, you think back to a very important promise that you probably made, at least if you were raised Lutheran and you were went through confirmation the traditional way, and maybe even when you were an adult, depending on what happened, um, you probably said the promises that we have in Lutheran service book, the same hymnal, and they were the same in, in Lutheran worship, and they were the same in the, the Lutheran hymnal. Um, so going way back, um, the promises were all very similar. Uh, you were probably asked um, something like, do you intend to live according to the word of God and in faith, word and deed remain true to Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even to death? There's another similar promise. Uh, will you stay faithful to the evangelical Lutheran uh, faith and suffer all, even death, rather than fall apart from it? So we may be a little bit critical of Peter for making such a wild promise that he would lay down his life rather than deny the Lord, and yet all of us have probably made that promise in one sense uh, when we were confirmed. We've promised to stay faithful to the Lord, and yet do we live up to it? Well, not all of us anyway, or not all the time. Uh, and of course, look at how many have, have departed from the faith over the last, I guess, depends on your age a little, but 
you're looking back maybe at the last 20, 30, 40 years, how long has it been since you were confirmed? How many of your confirmation class is still active in a, in a Lutheran church like they swore before God's altar that they would be? And so we all know promises are easy to make. Promises are much harder to keep. And in our lives, sometimes we have promises that we maybe intend to keep, but at some point we don't keep them. Maybe we got married and we said, I do. And our spouse also said, I do. And then later on we decided, I don't. Or they decided, I don't. Or something else came in between and the marriage fell apart. And so we know that the claim is easy. It's easy to write a check, but it's not always easy to have the funds to cash that check out. And sometimes we're found with insufficient Funds. And that's sort of what happened with Peter today. Of course, he goes into this courtyard of the high priest. He kind of sneaks in there. He's probably not really supposed to be in there. John kind of gets him in. And uh, he's a little bit like watching a train wreck. He's a little bit like watching a building that slowly starts to collapse. Um, maybe you start to see a crack or a fissure in a building and then sort of like watching a train, mech, train wreck in slow motion. I know I'm mixing metaphors here. You know, the building starts to slowly go down and you can hardly turn your eyes from it because you know what's coming. And crack by crack, the building starts to collapse. I guess I've been watching a lot of buildings like that with all the coverage in, in Ukraine. And so um, we see this collapse slowly happening before us. And that's sort of what happens to Peter's uh, Peter's resolve, I guess you could say, in this lesson. You know, he first comes in and there's a servant girl, you know, presumably just a little girl. In fact, some translations call her a slave. Uh, and she's answering the door and she says, aren't you one of his disciples? And of course, even to the servant girl, who presumably doesn't have much power or authority over him, he denies it to her. Um, but then he goes over to the charcoal fire and he's going to going to kind of hang out there and some other people come up to him and say, uh, aren't you one of his disciples? And again, he, 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 he denies it. And so it's sort of like these cracks, these little fissures uh, are just are going crack by crack through him. And then the final crack comes uh, when one of Malchus's relatives asks Peter, did I not see you in the garden with him? Do you guys remember who Malchus is? Yeah, if you were here last week, I think, wasn't that where Deacon Johnson was here last week with Malchus? But if you weren't here, Malchus, of course, is the servant of, of the high priest. And Peter had cut his ear off, right? And then remember, Jesus uh, restored his ear. But you can imagine why Peter's getting nervous, because he's not supposed to be in the high priest's courtyard. They're looking for Jesus' followers to round them up and maybe crucify them, too. And now he's just recently cut this guy's ear off, and now some of his relatives are in the courtyard asking, aren't you one of those, one of those guys that was with Jesus? And of course, Peter denies it vehemently. He again de denies it, and the rooster crows, and then of course, Jesus' prophecy comes back to him, right? He remembers that Jesus had prophesied, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And then I'm sure Peter feels about this big. He feels that guilt just come flooding in. He's overwhelmed with the, the guilt. He's kind of wondering if he's even worthy to be a disciple. And the same thing happens for us. We've all experienced that collapse of guilt. It could be, uh, like I said, a, a relationship that we broke by careless words. It could be an addiction where we keep going back to it again and again and it breaks us and we carry that guilt with us. Um, and so we all know what Peter is feeling on this, on this night. Normally I love leftovers and uh, I like leftovers, especially for the first day after Thanksgiving. I know maybe you do too. Do you think that the, the Thanksgiving sandwich that comes usually the day after Thanksgiving is the best one? I like a turkey sandwich open-faced on a piece of bread and then I put it on a plate and then I smother it with gravy because that's how I like it and eat it that way and that's actually sometimes I enjoy that more than the Thanksgiving dinner itself. 
Uh, but we all know kind of what happens with leftovers, right? You probably enjoy it the first day. Maybe the second day of leftovers, not so much. By the third day, you're kind of making up excuses to eat something else, even though you kind of want to eat this turkey up and you don't want to throw it out, but it gets pushed to the back of the fridge and it becomes sort of like you got to either force yourself to eat it against your will or you just don't eat it and eventually you wind up throwing it out. And so sometimes when people are suffering from guilt, they feel a little bit like the leftovers. And sometimes that's because relationships have been broken. Maybe you're in a work environment where relationships have been harmed. And so now you feel like you're the leftovers, like everybody's against you and you have to keep going to this place because you're dependent on it economically, you can't retire yet. And yet you think, how can I work here for 10 more years or 15 more years and work with these people? And you sort of feel like leftovers. Or maybe it's in a family relationship where you're living with a spouse, where you have a strained relationship, or you have a child in your life, maybe an adult child who, who uh, you have a strained relationship with. And pretty soon the guilt makes you feel like a leftover. And so you don't really want to keep trying to patch things up again and again. And that is kind of the way guilt makes us feel, like we're second rate, uh, like we don't matter very much anymore. Um, and that's how Peter must have felt among the disciples after he denied Jesus three times. John was there to witness it. Now I'm sure he didn't feel like he was the leader of the disciples, maybe he didn't even feel like he was a disciple anymore and guilt often does this it turns us into very miserable weary angry stressed out people and yet the good news for us tonight when i ask who loves leftovers is that god loves leftovers god can take any leftover and turn it into a five-star meal god can take any leftover any old turkey that's been sitting in the fridge for three or four days and he can make it better than anything that Gordon Ramsay could make or any of these celebrity chefs. God loves leftovers. He works with leftovers. That's his specialty. And think about how he worked with the leftovers of Peter. After the resurrection, you know what happened. Jesus came to Peter. Jesus asked Peter three times, Peter, do you love me? And of course, each time Peter said, yes, I love you, Lord. And of course, this was a subtle rebuke because Peter had denied him three times, but it also was a subtle restoration uh, when Jesus finally said, Peter, feed my sheep. He was saying, Peter, you're restored. You're back to the number one spot. You're the leader. You're the one who I'm going to work through uh, as I begin my church on earth. And God did fantastic things through Peter, didn't he? God loves a good comeback. Jesus loves a good comeback. That's their specialty. And so who preached the sermon on the day of Pentecost? It was Peter. And when Peter preached that sermon, what happened? 3,000 people were converted to the Christian faith by the power of the Holy Spirit, but it was through Peter as the Spirit's servant who got to write two books of the New Testament. It was Peter. And so Peter makes this fantastic comeback. But of course, I shouldn't really say Peter made it. I should say Jesus made it for Peter. Because when it comes to comebacks, it doesn't matter how much we love Jesus. It matters how much Jesus loves us. Comebacks don't depend on what we do for Jesus, but rather they depend on what Jesus did for us on the cross. And comebacks don't depend on us giving our life for Jesus. Rather, they depend on Jesus giving his life for us. And so Jesus works with leftovers. Jesus will give you that comeback that you need. And remember Black Bart, that Black Bart of guilt? At the end of the day, Black Bart was nothing to be afraid of. They finally discovered who Black Bart was. Black Bart was a mild-mannered businessman from Decatur, Illinois. His real name was Charles Bowles, and he was not what people had thought he was. He didn't live up to all the paintings of him riding a horse with his gun 
robbing people. In fact, it turned out this Charles Bowles was a little bit neurotic himself. In a day when people got around by riding on horseback, he was actually afraid to mount a horse on horseback. Uh, apparently, he was okay with saddling uh, a buggy. And so he actually performed all his robberies in a buggy because he was too afraid to ro ride a horse. Uh, he also was a little bit afraid of guns. And so he carried a six-shooter on all his adventures, but he never bought any bullets for his six-shooter. And he never loaded his six-shooter with bullets. And every single robbery he did, for all those years, he did it with an empty gun. And so, while people were afraid of Charles Bowles, it turns out that he was really no one to be afraid of. If anybody would have fought back at any time, he wouldn't have had any bullets to even shoot with. So, this is how guilt is. Guilt is like a gun with no bullets. Guilt can scare you if you let it, but we shouldn't let guilt scare us because all our guilt was taken away when Jesus went to the cross. Guilt is a black Bart in more ways than one. And that means that our story isn't over when Jesus is in it. Jesus is always ready to help us make that comeback. And so today, we want to stop talking about the first G word, which is guilt, and remember that that G word is always balanced off by another G word, which is grace. And so tonight, I want to leave you with grace. Amen. Please rise. May that peace which passes all understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Thanks for listening. At Redeemer Lutheran Church, our mission is to share with all people the good news of Jesus Christ, teaching faith and love. Learn more about our ministry at RedeemerLutheranGB.com.